Hello, welcome to the third session of the uh, 51st Martin Center Research Seminar Series. And this, uh, this seminar is hosted and supported by the Martin Center for Architecture and Urban Studies at University of Cambridge. The new series has successfully kicked off the three weeks ago with particular focus on architecture and energy. So today we have invited Dr. Rehab Khalid to share her research on a, a socio-technical approach to domestic energy demand in Pakistan. So also joining with us today in the panel is Dr. Mi, uh, Dr. Mina Snika Blank, who is Deputy Head of the Arch uh, Department of Architecture and part of Behavior and the Building Performance Research Group. Thank you for joining uh, with us today. I'm Kai, one of the conveners of the seminar series this year, and my colleague Yue is working with me today to broadcast this seminar. We will open the channel for questions after the seminar. There are several options to interact with our speakers. You may either raise your hands by clicking on the bottom of the screen and our conveners will invite you to the panel. So please don't forget to unmute yourself as a panelist. Please notice that the talk today is streaming live on Facebook uh, until the beginning of the Q&A session, which won't be recorded on our YouTube channel. So please rest assured and join in our discussion later. And another way to interact with our speaker is to leave your message in the Q&A box and our convener will help you to convey the message to the speakers. So now I'd like to hand over to Mina to chair the session today. Mina. Okay, thank you, Kai, and thank you for setting all this up so well to Kai and uh, colleagues like you. Eh? So uh, it's with great pleasure that I would like to introduce Dr. Rehab Khalid's work today. Uh, Rehab did a PhD uh, with me and is now um, a junior research fellow at Lucy Cavendish. So we are very lucky to have her to stay in Cambridge. So uh, what I think is very exciting about Rehab's work, that it looks at this old dilemma that uh, buildings don't consume energy, people do, and how can we better understand people's behavior. And Rehab does has done that in the context of so, uh, social practice theory. So she focuses more on uh, people's routines and habits rather than energy use as something which is very uh, rational behavior. And the other stream that I think is very interesting in Rehab's work is to look at how these middle income households in Pakistan have uh, started to adopt quite unsustainable building typologies that have open floor plans, large, large glass surfaces, how, and how that has come about. So a um, lot of interesting data she has collected in Lahore in Pakistan. So Rehab, please go ahead. And I think afterwards there will be a chance to ask questions. Thank you so much, Mina, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Kai, uh, for inviting me to talk today uh, in this Martin Center lecture. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so let me now begin. So the title of my talk today is A Socio-Technical Approach to Domestic Energy Demand, a case study of middle-class housing in Pakistan. So uh, my talk today is based on um, my research and uh, which I uh, published in these two papers, which I have listed here. Uh, it was part of my PhD research. Um, so let me start with the background of the study. Energy consumption in the global south uh, is predicted to grow to nearly three times that of the developed world by 2040. And almost by 2030, almost 80% of the middle class globally is expected to be residing in the global south and will be responsible for 70% of energy consumption worldwide. Now, Pakistan is one such country in the global south that has been facing increasing gaps between its energy supply and demand. It's also identified as being among the top 10 countries most vulnerable to climate change. Now, the common form of demand management in Pakistan has been electricity load shedding, where the power remains shut down intermittently for six to eight hours in the urban areas and even longer in the rural sector. And this serves as the last resort to overcome these energy gaps. 
Now, I like to show this image because I find it very interesting. So this is a satellite view of the city of Lahore, taken in 2013. Um, and it actually shows you where the load setting was taking place at the time. So all of these black patches is where there was a blackout. Now, you can clearly imagine that this has had a profound effect on the GDP of the country, but also on the daily lives of the people. Now, before we can tackle this issue of demand management, I think it's important to understand what energy demand is for and how it has come about. So one way of looking at it is to think of energy as an input that provides products or services. However, an alternative view is to think of energy demand as an outcome of what people and organizations do. And this is the view that has been taken up by a number of social scientists, especially practice theorists, um, and it forms the, min the fundamental uh, analytical tool in my research. So what is social practice theory? Social practice theory is a way of looking at the world. It's a cultural framework that posits that the basic focal point of analysis should be practices. So instead of um, looking at individuals and their rational choices or at collective normative structures, the basic focal point and the basic unit of analysis should be the doings and sayings of people. Now, in my methodological framework, I try to bring together these two parallel streams um, in two separate disciplines. So the place for space in social theory and the notions of social in architecture. Now, reviewing this uh, literature in these two parallel but distinctly uh, different streams helped to reveal some of the, um, some of the ways in which the social and uh, the spatial are deeply interconnected and mutually dependent. So from these two streams, uh, these are some of the analytical frameworks and concepts that I specifically used in my work. So I mostly draw on Strove and Panzer's model of practice um, as formed of three basic elements, competence, meanings, and materiality. I have combined this with an STS understanding of architecture as a mediator using the egg fright model proposed by Muller and Reichman, uh, which suggests that architecture as one form of materiality is itself a social construct. And as such, it can mediate social action. And finally, I combine this with Satsi's framework of practice arrangement bundles, which suggests that both the social and the material structures together define social order. And so I collected both qualitative and quantitative methods um, or data um, to define and that define household electricity consumption through a mixed method socio-technical approach. Okay, so for me, the starting point really was to um, understand how did we get to this point, you know, to this contemporary state of household practice arrangements and resulting electricity consumption. And in this talk today, I'm going to be focusing on part of the answer to this uh, by looking at the co-evolution of the social and the material structures of domestic energy demand. So let me take you through a timeline of how the house spaces, together with the accompanying social practices, have evolved over the last century in Lahore. Starting with the old part of Lahore, which is called the Wall City. Now, until the 19th century, construction of housing had followed much the same pattern, with attached row houses in a maze-like urban fabric. The traditional houses um, represent the central courtyard design. And traditionally, Muslim houses were designed to be introverted, based on a strict demarcation of private and public life, expressed in distinct layers of accessibility through the architecture. As you can see here, the central courtyard was the focal point of the house and so most conducive to female practices, including cooking, watching, bathing, cleaning, um, evening entertainment and relaxation, and even sleeping at night. 
This was then surrounded by a layer of semi-private rooms, which were used interchangeably throughout the seasons uh, for various functions like the extension of the cooking practice, for sitting and for storage. And then there was the outer layer, the outer periphery, which contained a betak, uh, a sitting room, and a second courtyard, which would open onto the street and was used for hosting male gatherings as an extension of the public space. Now, during the colonial occupation in the late 19th century, housing for the ruling British class departed from tradition, introducing new meanings of ideal home and appropriate hygiene resulting in a new housing typology called the British bungalow. The house design now reversed in on itself. So the built area was now in the center, surrounded by large outdoor spaces. Also, verandas and central passageways were introduced for proper air circulation, um, as well as designated spaces like offices, study areas, and dining rooms. But most significant was the absence of a centrally enclosed courtyard space. Now, by the 1920s, the local affluent residents had started building their own housing communities in imitation of the colonial spaces, resulting in a hybridized bungalow, where the front reflected the colonial ideologies, while the back remained traditional in use. So you can see the kitchen was now spun around and attached back to the main structure. Uh, the dining hall pushed back for closer proximity, but most significantly, the backyard had now replaced the central courtyard as the focal point of activity. Now, after independence in 1947, many new planned housing schemes were developed under the new local authorities. Um, and during this time, the building regulations gradually changed in two major ways. First, the plot sizes reduced over time. Um, and of course, this was understandable because of the population expansions, as well as the increasing land prices. But at the same time, the maximum permissible covered area ratios increased. And so the result of this was that the veranda, central passageways and backyards started to reduce in size. Now, by the 70s and 80s, two major technological changes took place. The first was the introduction of televisions, which uh, now became the focus of evening entertainment and relaxation activities, even giving rise to these spaces like TV lounges. But most importantly, it was the advent of mechanical ventilation and cooling that completely revolutionized the spatial configuration. So as you can see, the verandas and the central passageways have now disappeared. Uh, the backyard has significantly reduced in size, but most importantly, the built area now dominates the unbuilt. Now, Lahore has been expanding exponentially since the turn of the century. And from here to the present, it has simply been a matter of progressively increased dependency on mechanical means, not just for comfort, but for almost all household practices. So contemporary house spaces today follow a more condensed, deep, open plan configuration in line with Western modernism and postmodernism with maximized covered areas, uh, minimal outdoor spaces. Um, and just look at the number of different spaces that are defined within this uh, interior zone. Now, although the modern movement was coined on the principles of form following function, unfortunately, in the case of Lahore, this has meant an imitation of Western functions in replicas of Western forms in which aesthetics have played center stage. So what does this analysis tell us? Um, the analysis shows that there have been three key processes of change in household practices and arrangements that have given rise to increasing household electricity consumption. So the first is a shift from more outdoor to indoor activities. Now we saw how the central courtyard was replaced by the backyard, which gradually reduced and then completely disappeared under the changing building regulations uh, and technological advancements. Um, if we look at electric appliance ownership statistics, we find that, I mean, certainly these have increased over time. 
But what is daunting to see is that um, in contemporary houses today, almost 47% of the total household electricity consumption goes into space cooling in some shape or form. Secondly, there has been a shift from an inward to an outward oriented design. So traditionally, havelis were designed to be introverted with layers of private and public life. Uh, the colonial inspired building regulations have had a profound effect on the privacy of outdoor spaces. Now, because of the close proximity of these narrow outdoor spaces, together with restrictions on the heights of boundary walls, um, these conflict with sociocultural norms of privacy and the result is that females no longer find these spaces conducive to their practices and so move indoors with greater reliance on mechanical means. But the interesting thing is that even indoor spaces have evolved. So the open planned indoor spaces with large glass windows also often don't provide the necessary privacy and segregation that is required. So a lot of the female participants in my interviews that I talked to had similar things to say. I want to have my privacy when I'm in my bedroom. I like that the curtains remain drawn always. I don't feel comfortable if neighbors and house staff can see inside. So clearly there is this conflict. And finally, there has been a spatial dispersion of practices. So traditionally spaces were designed to be multifunctional and polyvalent, promoting more collective use. Um, in bungalows, we saw that there were now designated spaces like separate offices, study areas, and dining rooms. And this was further promulgated by the replacement of very lightweight, uh, portable furniture that was used traditionally into heavy stylized and ornamental furniture, such as heavy dining sets, um, and then wooden framed single beds, which were then replaced by double beds in the 80s. So clearly, um, our expanding material dependency has been at fault. But so have the changing sociocultural norms from more collective to more individualized practices. A case in point being uh, the entertainment facilities that we have today. So about 30 to 40 years ago, um, usually there would be a single television set in the house to cater to the needs of everyone in the household. Uh, but now we see that there are two or three television sets and other entertainment facilities to cater to the needs of, if not the individual, then at least the separate generations living in the same house. Okay, now having done this analysis, the next question for me was really, where do we go from here? So what type of interventions in practices could lead to improved sustainability and reduced consumption. Now, the thing is, it's always easier to identify the problems than it is to propose solutions. And so I decided to flip this question on its head and to really look at how the house design and the built environment um, impact on household practices and energy consumption. So one way that I did, did this was by using uh, Sperling and Partners practice-based sustainability intervention framework, which suggests that um, a shift towards sustainability and low energy interventions can be attained through recrafting practices, so changing elements within practices, or by substituting practices themselves, or by changing how different practices integrate and are organized together. Now this will become a bit clearer through my own case study. So this time around, I selected three critical case study houses that represent stark differences in their built environments to see how this would then affect household practices. So the first is a conventional contemporary house, which is very similar to the house that we saw at the end of the timeline. So this is a detached bungalow style house with open planned living room. Um, large glass windows and narrow non-functional outdoor spaces and almost complete reliance on mechanical ventilation and cooling. Now I did a spatial temporal mapping of the homeowners practices through the interviews as well as through time use diaries um, just to see what household practices uh, were being performed in what spaces uh, through a typical summer day. 
And if we look at the conventional case, we see that there is sparing use of the outdoor spaces because there really aren't any to begin with. Um, but also there are lots of um, intermittent use of the indoor spaces. So one of the things that the homeowners explicitly uh, mentioned was that they found it very difficult to use their living room, uh, especially during the heat, uh, the peak heat period of the day in the late afternoon. And so they ended up uh, using their drawing room. And this was because their living room had been built on an open plan format and they just couldn't make it comfortable. You can also see how much uh, there is reliance on mechanical means for comfort. Okay, the second case it's, is a very interesting and innovative low energy eco house. Um, and this is a semi detached house that's what, that was built by a local architect for himself. It's a climate responsive building designed for improved thermal comfort with maximum provision of green outdoor spaces. Um, there's plenty of roof insulation from the roof gardens and the green spaces cover 80% um, of the total plot area. There's also a 22 feet high louvered boundary wall that allows the air to circulate while filtering out solar radiation. Now the only reason that the homeowners were able to construct such a high wall was because of the leniency of the building regulations in this particular housing scheme. So this together with the raised passageway here, provides a very nice um, and comfortable uh, outdoor, a uh, private outdoor space, which includes a vegetable patch, a space for keeping pets and poultry, um, water fountains, and lots of space for the kids to play. Um, now, this house is also based on an open plan format, but in this case, it has been made possible through the use of um, a central cooling system. So the architect devised a low energy ground source cooling mechanism by using these long ducts that pass through uh, underneath the entire house. Um, and through evaporative coolers and dehumidifiers, cold, uh, cool air is then blown into all of the different spaces and it is automated through time control. Another interesting feature of the house um, is that the entire layout is planned on incremental step gradations between the adjacent spaces, avoiding the typical splitting of floors into distinct levels. Um, and this allows for a much more organic and integrated flow. A comparative analysis of the temperature and humidity data uh, for the three cases shows that because of the better insulation in the eco house, as well as the provision of a basement, um, it shows much more stable indoor environment uh, with overall lower mean temperatures. And for the third case, we actually come back to the same Haveli that we started off with at the beginning of our timeline. Now, before I explained how this was being used a century ago, but the same family now in its seventh generation occupies, uh, occupies this Haveli. And so we look at its contemporary use. Now we find that the central courtyard is still being used, but more so for special occasions, such as get togethers and religious festivals. The kitchen and uh, the wash washing machine is still partly located outside and so the cooking and laundering practices are being performed outdoors. But one of the things that I found most interesting was that even though the house has been designed for passive thermal comfort, um, localized air conditioners, these split units, have been installed in a number of uh, the indoor spaces. Um, and this was because even with the passive design, uh, the, the indoor temperatures, especially on the first floor, can go up to 37 degrees Celsius. Now, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, because of the uh, outside temperatures have risen over the years, um, and there are a number of factors for this, you know, like climate change, uh, but also because of the excessive air pollution um, and the extensive urban heat island effect. So this house is located in a highly uh, dense area with, uh, with you know, a, a very um, high population density and lots of construction and built in, uh, 
uh, in, in lots of houses. And so it, because of that, um, there is some need for mechanical ventilation and cooling. But also because of our increased standards for thermal comfort. So during the interviews with the homeowners, it became apparent that you know, the homeowners were reflexive ab ab about this, uh, about the idea that you know, they understood that their house was designed uh, to, to be lived in without mechanical means, um, which would have been possible you know, as a number of years ago. Um, but they, you know, some of the things they said were around, you know, if I'm coming out of an air conditioned car, I want to go back into an air conditioned space. And so um, it's also about the increased comfort standards uh, and our social norms around comfort. So having said this, there were some plus points as well. So the first floor of the Haveli has been converted into a museum and the homeowner who is the curator of that museum works from home. Now, please imagine this in the pre-COVID era where it actually meant something. Um, so in a lot of the new housing societies today, they don't allow mixed use uh, development and mixed use in uh, residential areas. Um, and so you can't really have a home office. Um, also, the wall city has been designed on an inclusive zoning format, which means that the residential, commercial, educational and business districts have not been separated. Um, and this actually has had a, an, a profound effect on some of the household practices like cooking and laundering. So Haveli is actually located in the center of uh, a marketplace. And whenever the homeowners need something, instead of stocking up on lots of different prod products and groceries, um, they purchase items on a needs basis. So right opposite the Haveli, there is a bakery, a chaiwala, a tea server, uh, a tanur, which is a bread oven, uh, even an ATM, a tailor, and a watchmaker. Um, and this was the only house that I interviewed from all of the different houses in all the different parts of Lahore that did not own a deep freezer. Uh, which is something quite unusual for a middle and upper middle class family living in Lahore today. Um, even the laundering practice was found to be different. So um, most of their laundry is being outsourced to a nearby communal laundry facility. Again, something which is not readily available in some of the new housing schemes. Okay, so we've looked at these three cases. Now, Let's look at how practices compare in these three different houses. So if we use the practice-based intervention framework and take the conventional house as the control case, we see that interventions in comfort-related practices have been successfully achieved in the eco-house, not only through changes in the material elements, but also in the skills required for alternative technology implementation and use. And also, in the changed meanings around health and comfort uh, and well-being uh, related to comfort practices. So the homeowners in this case were adamant that they did not want to have those localized air conditioners that tend to isolate and confine spaces and recirculate air. So they wanted to have a proper air circulation through evaporative cooling. Now, both the Eco House and the traditional Haveli were able to substitute some indoor uh, practices with outdoor space use, which means less reliance on uh, artificial lighting and mechanical cooling during the time spent outdoors, uh, but also a better overall utilization of the space. In terms of how practices are interlocked, um, and organized, we see that in the Haveli, because of its mixed use development, it allows a home office of sorts. Um, and the inclusive zoning format has led to different cooking, laundering, and mobility practices, which results in different energy profiles, which are perhaps less energy intensive. Now, exploring practice based interventions in design and use doesn't just end here. It's relatively easier to form links between uh, house design and spatial configurations with household practices and electricity consumptions. However, I would argue that it's equally important to take a step back and to look at the wider system of housing practices. That is the practices involved in housing design, development and production. 
and to explore how these impact on household practices through the architecture as a mediator. Now, if we explore some of these links in the case of Pakistan, we see that by substituting and recrafting or you know, changing how practices interlock um, at, the, at, at the level of housing practices, we, can, we are able to then have an impact on household practices. So for instance, by substituting stringent prescriptive regulations with uh, more flexible custom tailored bylaws to meet minimum standards, um, or by recrafting design practices through better knowledge and skills of the practitioners, and by changing how the practices are interlocked uh, by, for example, promoting more efficient, sustainable, and locally procured uh, material supply chains, and also by providing good uh, links of communication between the different stakeholders, we can potentially lead to less energy intensive household practices, um, such as by promoting greater outdoor space use, ensuring privacy, uh, in um, giving rise to changed meanings of comfort and well being, and leading to more collective practice arrangements. So, taking such a holistic systems of practices approach helps to reveal how domestic energy consumption is contingent on interlocking household and housing practices. And in this, um, we see that then individual actors such as architects as designers or homeowners as the end users have limited agency for change within this wider system. And so this then pr provides a contestation to the conventional behavior change models that put the responsibility of change on individuals to make the right choices. Okay, so coming to the conclusions now, I hope that what my analysis has been able to show is that household energy consumption is embedded in both the material and the social structures, whether they're at the micro level of the household or the macro level of housing development, and that these social and material structures are mutually dependent, co-evolve, and so require a joint analysis for us to really get to the crux of what uh, demand management is all about. The key point here is that focusing on just the technology or even just the social um, is not enough and it will inevitably result in gaps where for the estimated performance will not match up to the actual performance. So my analysis has shown that differences in the built environments shape practices differently. But at the same time, it also shows that domestic electricity consumption has continued to increase in the global south despite improvements in appliances and material and building fabrics. So assigning technology complete agentive power is misleading. Context is extremely important. A blind following of westernized modernistic spatial configurations and functional distributions have continued to regenerate practice arrangements that are not only climatically and culturally ill-suited, but are inherently more energy intensive. Um, and although my study has been done for a very specific context, um, there are certainly implications for um, other contexts and for other areas as well. So for example, studies in the UK have shown that although the efficiency of the housing stock and heating systems has increased, but so has the demand for space heating. And finally, looking at some of the implications for policy and research, um, I hope that um, a, a socio-technical approach that takes a longitudinal dimension, as has been shown in this study by looking at practice arrangements, can really help us to reframe policy so that we begin to target some of the more vital issues around how our spaces designed, perceived, and used, instead of just uh, looking at technological and material efficiencies. Um, I think it's high time now that we start to tackle some of these more important questions around the need to build and the use of build. Secondly, house planning policies and energy policies need to be developed in collaboration because otherwise they can end up contradicting each other, as has been shown in my case, where, for example, building regulations continue to promote indoor space use and reproduce these 
outdoor non-functional negative voids, um, which lead ultimately lead to increased energy consumption. So there needs to be a better integration and dialogue between energy and non-energy policies. And finally, um, I think it is now quite um, a widespread, there is widespread agreement that multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches are key to tackling some of the global 21st century challenges around climate change and sustainability. Um, and in this, I believe that the social sciences and humanities can have a critical role to play because it is these kinds of perspectives that can really help us to recognize and prevent the normalization of standards uh, for the perfect home that gradually become embedded in our institutional and infrastructural systems. I'd like to end my talk today um, with these very thought-provoking words by the social scientist Thomas Guy Wren, who said that the play of agency and structure happens as we build. We mold buildings, they mold us, we mold them anew. Thank you so much. <laughs>